Good morning, Fern Creek. Welcome. I'm, we're all moving a little slow this morning from the fall festival yesterday, but we're here anyway to praise the Lord no matter how our bodies feel. to all those that are here and all those out on social media we give a special warm welcome to any first first timers that might be here or watching uh, today is lay sunday in case you notice i'm not daryl but we're, we're going to celebrate all that the lay people of this church do and not just this church but the church worldwide and without the lay people there's a lot that wouldn't get done believe me the and yesterday was the fall festival and thanks to all that supported that and that's a very good example of what the lay people of the church can do. So for announcements that we got today, uh, don't forget the attendance pads in the, the end of the aisle, fill that out. And um, for any prayer requests, please write those down, uh, drop them in either the basket, uh, we already have it up here, or you can text them to Pastor John, the number's up on the screen there. Um, so I already talked about the Harvest Festival, but all those that volunteered and that came, thanks a lot. The weather was maybe a little damp, a little cool, but we had a great time. And thanks to Desiree and Renee and all those that pitched in. So the Operation Christmas Child um, is starting to, to wind down in terms of the time that we have to bring the boxes in. So make sure that if you have a box, bring it in this month. If you haven't got your box yet, there's still some to be had out there at the table in the North Axe. Um, make sure you sign up when you take a box out and when you bring it back. And then 
the greatest event of all time, the AMC <laughs> annual chili cook-off is coming up soon. It's going to be, uh, uh, Outback is going to be, you know, bringing some stuff in. There'll be a co-sponsor. And uh, it's on Saturday, November the 4th. Uh, if you want to bring in a chili and compete against mine, that'll be great. Uh, there's a list out on the North X also where you can sign in your name and you know, say that you want to bring a chili. And my understanding is they're going to give prizes to the top six chilies this year. So hopefully we'll have maybe um, five or six and everybody will get a prize. <laughs> oh, I hope we have more than that. So today there is a church council meeting at 530. And that, that's an important meeting that um, we want ever, you know, one that part of the church council to be there to vote. And then the annual charge conference uh, was October 22nd. So some of the business that the church council that be voted on is business that we're taking to the charge conference. So that's uh, the two are kind of connected together. And there'll be details in the bulletin that you can look at. So, yes, today's psalm <laughs> is uh, Psalm 106, verses 1 through 5. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare his praise? Blessed are those who act justly, who always do what is right. Remember me, Lord, when you show favor to your people. Come to my aid when you save them, that I may enjoy the prosperity of your chosen ones that I might share in the joy of your nation and join your inheritance in giving praise. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Father, thank you that you promise us that where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. Lord, we welcome you among us today and celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. We ask all this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's children's moment now. countries in the United States or in the world <clears throat> and even including the United States. We had over a million shoe boxes last year right here in the United States. So they go all over. Now this ministry helps kids get school supplies. As some of us, us know, we had a young man here a couple years ago named Luis Gonzalez and he got a shoe box that has school supplies. His mom prayed that he would get school supplies, and he did. And now he is here in Louisville, and he is a vice president of a bank. <clears throat> There's a girl in Louisville who is an artist that received a shoebox. She got a, a water paint set. So, I mean, these boxes are really doing good. They're teaching the gospel. As, as these shoe boxes go over to these countries, now they're going by boat. They're going by rough terrain. They're going by camel. They go by donkeys. They go by all kinds of ways they can get these shoe boxes to these kids. Now, we don't put candy in these shoe boxes for one reason. The candy can mold because they don't get these shoe boxes maybe for eight to ten months. Because it's, it, even though they say it's Operation Christmas Child, it is Christmas to them when they get this box. 
because this is one box per child for their, their whole life until they can either come to the United States or wherever they go. This, this is the only box they're going to get right here. So we like to make sure they get something that they can hold on to. There was a girl yesterday I, I watched, and she said, she's 30-something years old now. And she's still carrying this animal. That meant so much to her that she got a stuffed animal, something that is cuddly. She slept with it. She still has it. Her baby has it. And wherever, whenever she goes out of the house, she takes it with her. It's in her car until she goes home with her baby. The guy that was here, he had one. And when he went to Florida, somebody broke into his trunk and stole his. Stole his luggage and, it, and he, had, he, had his little, he had a little lamb that he'd gotten when he got his shoebox. And they took that. So he went out and bought another little lamb because he wanted to have that lamb. Another thing the little girls love to get is a doll. And they like these kind because they're cuddly. One thing that nobody would have thought of that they would really care about, they love letters. People write to them. Some people give them their address, and they write back. There's a little girl named Katie that wrote to one of the girls over there, and now they're best friends, and Katie uh, and her now live in the same city here in, in the United States. So it can spread. But one thing that really spreads is once they get these shoe boxes, they get a book, and it's called The Best Journey Ever or something like that, The Greatest Journey. And it's, it talks about Jesus Christ. And so many of them have become saved because of these shoe boxes as well as these books. They take a 12-week course, and they get a certificate, and they get baptized. So there, there is something about these shoe boxes that mean a lot. Now... I'm amazed, but the 2 to 4-year-olds and the 10 to 14-year-olds don't get as many as the 5 to 9-year-olds. They had a stack of 5 to 9-year-olds. Now, when they, these shoe boxes leave our church, we take them to Highview Baptist, where they get boxed up, put on semis. They go to North Carolina, Atlanta, the big distribution centers, where they go by plane to, and, and first of all, before I say anything else, they get sniffed by dogs. They bring dogs in. They check the shoe boxes, make sure there's nothing in them that's going to harm the children. They make sure there's no glass in the boxes. Each box gets open individually in North Carolina, Atlanta, and the other areas. So they are checked before they get sent over. And then once they get sent over, they have missionaries and volunteers that go to these countries and sit there and watch these kids open these boxes. So we want to make sure that we don't put glass in there, no liquids at all. One box had everything liquid but one thing. <laughs> so everything had to get pulled out of the box and new things put in the box. They have a lot of fillers. If, and when we're downstairs, Maria and I will check each box and, and Mary. And when we check those boxes, if we see something that we don't think can go, we'll look at the list, we'll pull it out, we'll put something else in that we have downstairs. So we make sure each box is full before it leaves here. So those shoe boxes are very, very important ministry. Okay? So let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each child here. Lord, we thank you for Operation Christmas Child. It's a ministry that reaches out to so many children, from Ukraine to the Philippines to the United States and so on and so on. Lord, we bless each child. And we pray that they get the word from, about you. In your son's name, amen. A bunch of really pretty prayer shawls up here on the altar rail. Pastor John's going to come up and we're going to pray over them at this time. Well, today is the day in the life of the church when we celebrate the laity. And uh, it's a day that I always reminds me that a church doesn't really need me. You can operate just fine on your own. You know, the, they say that a, a really healthy a church just doesn't, doesn't skip a beat if the pastor's gone. So 
Anyway, but I still feel useful. I get to do this part. If you've ever quilted in the church or you currently are a quilter, would you raise your hand? Okay, several. Yeah, we appreciate you all. And what we're going to do now is we're going to consecrate, God's going to consecrate, and we're going to dedicate these, these quilts to the use of his service and to those that are going to get them. Can you imagine, like the Christmas child boxes, people are going to get these prayer shawls that have been prayed over while they were made, and they will have them to use, and uh, they're going to go to a lot of different places. So would you join me as we pray? Almighty God, we give you thanks for those that took their time and, and, and were, were uh, dedicated and concentrated on prayer and, and making these quilts. And for those, God, who are, who are going to get them, who are going to get these prayer shawls and quilts, God, we just pray that, that you would bless them in the places where they are. May this be something that... Uh, is symbolic of you wrapping your arms around them and, and our love going out to them as well. So God, set them apart, consecrate them for use in your service. We pray it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I think I'm shrinking. Well, this is a time that of the morning, and we've prayed already through, through things, but the, we want to get uh, down to brass tacks, so to speak. You know, there comes a time in our life that we can't serve at everything, but there's one thing we can always do is to be a prayer warrior. You can do it in your home. You can do it standing in the grocery store line. You can just do it anywhere. and. There are many times we struggle because the devil tells us that, uh, oh, we don't know what to pray for. We don't know how to pray. Well, I want to tell you, it's just talking to a friend. That's what prayer is. And that we would come to him and that we would lay our hearts down. So um, there was only one prayer request, well, three prayer requests in, but they were all from Monty. And Monty's prayers are very important to the Lord, so we want to remember to lift him up also. Monty many times is looking for a new friend, um, so many things. He enjoys life so much, and it's a pleasure to praise and worship with Monty. So he's very important in our church. So if you would go, come now and just let your heart sit for a moment, and let's talk to our Father, okay? Lord, we just come to you this morning with grateful hearts. Lord, there are so many things to pray about that sometimes we feel overwhelmed and we just don't even know what to do about anything. But Lord, we know that we can count on you. And Father, our brothers and sisters in Israel and uh, Palestine and all different areas, they are in trouble right now, Lord. And Lord, we're not surprised because your word has told us, told us that these days are coming. But Father, there are such horrific things that we're seeing. And help us not to just sit and watch and let all that go into our spirit. Just get up, turn it off, Lord, and help us to just sit before you. And thank you for the Holy Spirit that teaches us. And Lord, your son Jesus taught us how to pray. And Father, so we just come to you with our hearts open. Some of us are wounded. Some of us are ill. Some of us are facing terrible situations. But some of us, Lord, are just tired for serving you. And Father, we just ask that you will put a fresh anointing over this building over the people in it and that father we will have a new zeal for serving you lord we can't all do it but we can do something so father help us to learn what it is that we can do lord we thank you for our pastor and his family we thank you father for uh, a fresh air that blows in yes we still miss 
Pastor Jim, but it was time for him to do something else. And Lord, you sent the man of the hour to us. Lord, there are new plans. Uh, and Father, we're, you know, we're hoping that there will be room for our Cuban friends and Pastor uh, Daniel and all that uh, have been under his watch, care, and keeping. Lord, we pray that it will move swiftly. And Father, we thank you that you answered our prayers. We just didn't know how you were going to answer it. And so, Father, you did, though. And so we lift all this up to you. Father, help us not to grow weary in doing well. We must serve you. But the, the most important thing, Lord, is that we get out and we tell others about you, Jesus and what he's done for us. And Father, for all of us that have health issues, we ask you to lift us up and help us to be strong and to keep on going. Father, we pray for everyone that has pain and suffering or that has anything going on. We pray for the families, Lord. They will be strengthened. If fathers are not taking their place in the home, Lord, we call them to rise up and do so. Father, we call the children to come along and do and listen to the teaching of all those that have served over the years. Lord, we call all. Lord, there is a shofar blowing, one that is calling us all to repentance and calling us all, Lord, to wake up. The time is short, and Father, may we stand before the throne of God and all sit around the Lamb's table. Lord, there is going to be a day of reckoning. And Father, I would pray that we will all bow our knee to God and that we would ask for your forgiveness. We would ask your forgiveness, Lord, for uh, arguments and for wanting our way and for uh, just, just always, ne -me 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 -me. Lord, help us, help us, Lord, to be your witness. Help us, Lord, to reach out and touch those that are hungry and lonely. Lord, there are many in our church they may be hungry and lonely. Help them, God. Help those that are barely making it. Help those, Father, that have more than enough that they'd be able to release it, that they could do God's work. And Father, we ask all these things in your precious holy name as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory forever. Amen. I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders and signs, and you're still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are scars on your hands. That your goodness is good without end, and you'll never change. I will tell of your wonders, and sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. Generations 
slide said, and all generations will bow down and praise. On the way to church this morning, <clears throat> our next door neighbors, um, there's 11 people in that house that are sick. The flu or something, but really bad sick. And Chandler said, well, Oma, we need to pray for them. And I said, yes, we do, Chandler. Would you like to do that in the car on the way here? <laughs> he prayed for them. And it wasn't just because of me and Glenn but it's because of what he's learning here. And it's the time of the Sunday school teachers, those who lead children's worship, those who are working in the nursery that take time to teach our children how to pray. And so if you haven't had that opportunity to work with the children, you may think that's not your thing, but let me tell you, when you start working with them, you'll see what you've been missing out on all this time. So when you have the opportunity to help a Sunday school teacher, step in and help them. And those children will lighten up your heart like you'll, you won't believe. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to pour into our hearts that we would be able to give more to the Lord. That we would be able to give more to the children of this church. Nothing worth more that can ever come close 
No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I tasted and seen of the sweetest of love. Where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit. Holy
if you could come up and pray over Walter. Lord God, from the women at the tomb to the woman at the well to John Wesley to Billy Graham to our own pastor here, preaching of the word, the sharing of the gospel has been an integral part of our faith. Now we come to an important time of our service where that is going to happen. We're grateful again for Lazy Sunday. We're especially grateful this morning for uh, Walter and all that he means to you and means to us. We're thankful for his love of the word and the love of preaching the gospel. We ask now that you anoint him and may his words be your words this morning. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When anyone hears the word ministry in the church, typically every, everybody thinks of one thing and one thing only, and that's typically the pastor or preaching. But the Bible teaches differently because, you see, ministry involves a broad spectrum of abilities and activities that encompass much more than only the pastoring and the preaching that comes from the church. The Bible teaches that ministry is something that every single believer is equipped for by the Holy Spirit, and every single believer is expected to be involved in in some way, shape, or form. And that's going to look different in the church for different people. And so, just as it is with the physical body, the human body, where we have many, we have one body, but many different body parts, all working, doing their individual thing, their individual job, carrying out their individual function or role in the body, but yet working in coordination and conjunction with all of the other body parts of the body, for the good of the whole body, so it is in Christ's church. Every single member, every single believer is expected to be engaged in some way, shape, or form in a ministry of some type. Doing his or her own work that God has called him or her to, doing his or her own role, carrying out their function for the good of the entire church. Overworked members get tired, demotivated, and de-energized and burned out. Underworked members can oftentimes get lazy, slothful, and ineffective. But in either case, overworked or underworked, the church suffers loss in its effectiveness and in its efficiency. And so that's what I want to look at this morning in a message that I'm simply calling Ministry for All Members Using Our Spiritual Gifts. So look, if you will, on the screen. Thank 
Shirley, thank you. Rose. So look, if you will, at the screen, as we'll look at our text for this morning, and that's coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'll be reading select verses from verses 12 through 31, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and listen to what Paul writes to the church at Corinth. He says, beginning in verse 12, for as the body, he's talking about the physical body, the human body, as the body is one and has many members, many body parts, but all the members of that body being many are still one body, so is Christ. For in fact, the body is not one member, it's not one body part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If an ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, the body parts, each one of them, in the physical body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, one body part, where would the whole body be? But now indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. But God composed the body that there should be no schism, no division, no separation, no split in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the body parts suffer with it. Or if one member or one body part is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and members individually are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. And so this morning, I want to give you a few points, but plenty of scripture. Number one, in the human body, or the, I should say the human body is one body made up of a, of a variety of body parts, each part with its own individual unique function. Listen to what Paul writes. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant, for in fact the physical body is not one member, it's not just one body part, but it's many. But now indeed there are many members, there are many body parts, yet one physical body. There are about 12 different organ systems in the human body. Some of those organ systems and some of those body parts are different and have different functions. For example, the skeletal muscle versus, say, the stomach. And yet also, there are some systems and some body parts in the physical body that are similar or are different but have similar function, such as the ear and the cerebellum, which lies deep in the brain. Both of those contribute to balance and coordination. But regardless of the individuality of the body part, all the body parts have to work together in conjunction with the other body parts for the good of the whole physical body. Number two, just as it is with the human body, so too the church, and when I'm talking about church this morning, I don't want you to think about the global church, the universal church, the worldwide church. I want you to think about one church, the local church, and that is Fern Creek United Methodist Church. So think about that. Just as it is with the human body, so it is in the church. It's made up of individual members, spiritual body parts, I call them, each with his or her own individual, unique function, and particular ministry. Now let's read those same verses that we just read, but let's let Paul add the church to these verses. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant, for in fact the physical body is not one member, but many. But now indeed there are many members, yet one physical body. Now watch this. Now you, the church, you are the spiritual body of Christ and members individually. In other words, each person is a spiritual 
body part within the church. So just as it is with the human body, likewise in the church, each different believer fits into the body, into the church, just as God wants. And so therefore, you can have different believers who have different gifts who carry out different roles. For example, greeters, teachers, parking lot attendants, groundskeepers, deacons, pastors or ministers, outreach leaders, encouragers, custodians or housekeeping, musicians and singers, children's leaders, office managers, security personnel, committee members, program directors, cooks and service, servers, and all the rest. Or you can have different believers who have similar gifts, but who carry out slightly different functions. A teacher of adults in the church is going to operate differently than a teacher of children in the church. And yet if you're exercising a gift in any one of those areas that I've just listed or just mentioned, if you're exercising your gift and you're participating in that area of ministry to the best of your ability, you're doing it on a regular basis, you're serving God while you are serving the church, listen, you have a ministry. It's not a job. It's not just a role. It's not just a function. It's a ministry. And so you need to be carrying that out. And so once again, regardless of what the individual role or the office or the function or the work is of that person, still all the members must be doing their job in coordination with each other for the good of the whole functional unit, and that is the church. This next one, I want you to listen very carefully to this one. The lessons that we glean from this next point can be applied to any area of service within the church, but it especially applies to those who handle the Word of God. I'm talking about the teachers, the preachers, Sunday school classes, Bible classes, and all those kinds of things. Listen, in the human body, all the body parts must act in obedience to the head, which is the brain the electrical control center. In the church, all members must be living and acting in submission to the head, and that is Christ. Listen to what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse, uh, going from verses 11 through 15. And Jesus himself gave to his church some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? Number one, for the equipping of the saints for their ministry. And number two, for the edifying, in other words, the building up of the body of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, watch this, that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, and that is Christ. Listen, in the human body, the head is the electrical control center of all the rest of the body operations. You can mess with almost anything else, almost anywhere else in the rest of the body, and as long as the head, is not significantly affected or significantly damaged, the brain can continue normal body processes to sustain a person's life. But listen, if you mess with the head, if the head gets damaged, if the head gets significantly diseased, then that can amount to grave outcomes for the entire rest of the body, even unto death. And so it is in the church. Listen, if Christ, the head, is not being taught properly, if the head, which is Christ, is not being taught fully, if Christ is not being followed properly, if Christ is not being obeyed, then I'm telling you, you're setting yourself up to have a bunch of confusion, strife, discontent, discord, 
separation and division in Christ's body. You're going to have a diminished impact of the church on the culture. You're going to develop spiritual anemia, and you're going to end up getting into spiritual death in that church. Number four, in the human body, each part is essentially needed, and no part would ever dislike itself compared to another body part. In the church, no member should belittle him or herself and enviously wish to be another part or do that part's job. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, the body parts, each one of them in the physical body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, one body part, where would the whole body be? It would be totally absurd for an ear to wish that it were a foot simply because the foot can move around and the ear can't. Likewise in the church, if we're all knowing what our spiritual gift is, if we are all developing what our spiritual gift is, if we're engaged in some form of ministry or activity in the church in which we are using our spiritual gifts, and if we are especially seeing fruit produced from that role, that function, that ministry, then listen, nobody should ever have any reason to say, I wish I were another body part, or I wish I were another gift. And that's why it's so critically important for each and every Christian to know what his or her particular spiritual gift is so that they can know where they fit in the body of Christ. I've done many things over the years in the church, and it took me a while after serving faithfully in different roles, different functions, and different activities. It took a while to know exactly where I ideally and optimally fit into the body as opposed to simply things that I could do but were producing frustration and difficulty and burnout within myself. And so... As we were saying, if you know what your gift is and you're exercising that gift, you're developing that gift, you're learning, you're reading, you're studying, you're practicing, you're engaging in that ministry on a regular basis, and you're seeing fruit produced from that ministry in which you serve. Listen, you're going to receive, it's not about you personally, but you're still going to benefit from it. You're going to receive maximum satisfaction, fulfillment, and contentment because of the exercise of that gift and that fit where the Lord has you, and you're not going to want to be some other member. You're not going to want to be some other spiritual gift. You're not going to want to participate in some other ministry. Listen, you don't know what goes into the work in some other role or some other ministry, and so the issue here in terms of our gift is to find out what your gift is and then stay in your lane and go to work. It's as simple as that. Sure, there will be times when each of us will be called to step outside of our gift comfort zone. If you're married and your spouse is hanging off a cliff about to fall down and grabbing on uh, for, for fear of uh, uh, falling and dying and they're holding on for dear life and they call out to you, honey, Honey, help me. And you say, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, honey. I, I can't do anything about that. That's not my spiritual gift. That's not that sometimes we'll have to step outside of our comfort zone in terms of assisting the church where we're not particularly or strongly gifted. But to try to function consistently and to try to live constantly outside of where you fit and where you belong just because I want to do this, they asked me to do that and all the rest. Listen, you're setting yourself up for an optimal recipe of frustration, inadequacy, and burnout. 
And so the flip side of this previous point is clear also, is equally true also. Number five, in the human body, each part is essentially needed. In the church, no member should be little, not just him or herself, but no member should be little another body part or wish to do away with that part or that part's job, unless, of course, it's detrimental to the church. Paul says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Bible commentator William MacDonald says this, therefore, instead of being discontent with our lot, or on the other hand, instead of feeling a sense of independence from others, we should have a real sense of solidarity in the body of Christ. And so again, it would be totally absurd for the foot to say to the eye, man, I, I can't stand that eye. All that eye wants to do is just sit around and gawk at everything. That eye ought to get up off his do-nothing stool and learn how to move around like me. Well, the truth is that if the church were all feet and no eyes, the feet might be able to move the church, but we might not go in the right direction because the feet wouldn't have any eyes to see what's going on in front of it. And so, again, in the church, listen, everybody can't do everything. In fact, everybody shouldn't be doing just anything. Listen to what Paul says in verse 29. Are all apostles, and the way the Greek wording is in Paul's rhetorical questions here, uh, is that the answer to each of his questions is no. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Is everybody in the church supposed to be a teacher? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Do all have gifts of healings? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret tongues? No. And so, every person has a different gift or a different gift mix. And some person with a certain gift mix over here can't do the work over there. Somebody with a certain gift mix over there ought not be doing the work that's over here. But as we said early, the issue here is to find where you fit and to get in your lane and get to work in that specific area, in that specific ministry. But none of the church benefiting gifts, jobs, roles, or functions should be thought to be unnecessary or in need of elimination. The next thing I'd say is simply this. Number six, exercising your gift in the church doesn't mean you serve independently from the rest of the members, but that you contribute whatever you bring to the table, watch this, for the edification, the building up of the rest of the body. Listen, I teach, I preach, I don't cook. You wouldn't want me doing the server, being one of the cooks and the servers at some of our after-church dinners unless you wanted a side dish of Pepto-Bismol, okay? But what I do for you, you can't, might not be able to do for me. But what you can do for me in my time of need, I can't do. And so there's mutual care of each member by somebody within the body. So in the human body, all the parts work together to care for the whole body. In the church, mutual care comes from various angles. Listen to what Paul writes in verses 24 and 25. God composed the physical body that there should be no schism, no split in the human body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. So for example, let me give you an example. The human body receives its nourishment through food, through eating. And so how do the nutrients that we eat from food, how do the nutrients get into all of the cells of the body? Well, the bloodstream has to send, deliver all those micronutrients to all the cells of the body. But before the bloodstream can do that, the small intestine has to dissolve and chop, have, I'm sorry, has to absorb all of those micronutrients into the bloodstream. 
But it doesn't stop there. In order for the small intestine to do that, the stomach has to grind and chop down the food that we eat so that the stomach delivers smaller particles of food to the small intestine. But before the stomach can do its work, the esophagus, the food tube, has to deliver the food that we eat from the mouth to the stomach. But even before the esophagus can do its work, the mouth has to chew and grind up the solid food that we eat and grind it up into smaller particles. But even before the, the mouth can do that, listen, the shoulder, the arm, the forearm, the wrist, and the hand have to put the food, deliver the food into our mouth. All of that just so that our human body can be nourished from the simple contents of food. And so it is in the church. We've got to have all of our various parts doing their individual jobs in order for the whole body to be spiritually nourished. And spiritually nourished, number one, nourished every week from the Word of God. Nourished, number two, so that different people at different times of their lives, in different circumstances that they might find themselves in, can receive the needed care, the needed love, the needed compassion, the needed supply, the needed provision, the needed attention, the needed prayers from somebody in that congregation. And so if you look at the gift inventory, the listing of seven different spiritual gifts, they come just from one section of Scripture. There are several, but just from one section, and that's uh, Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, we have seven gifts listed. And so in the church, the people with the gift of prophecy need to be correcting error in the church. Those who with the gift of service need to be working as the practical hands and feet of the church. Those who are gifted as teachers need to be dishing out right doctrine. The gift of exhorter, the gift of exhortation or encourager needs to always be encouraging other people and giving them steps to right living. The person with the gift of giving needs to be supplying material assistance, material financial assistance to the church for the various projects and endeavors. Those with the gift of organization or administration or leadership need to be making sure all the church processes proceed in an orderly, sequential fashion. And then, finally, those with the gift of mercy need to be involved in comforting people during the crisis times of their lives. And so in the church, every member doing his or her part ought to allow, ought to allow for any given need by any given person at any given time to be able to be filled by somebody in the congregation. Number seven, in the human body, just one small condition somewhere, good or bad, can and will affect how the entire body feels. In the church, just one member's condition, good or bad, should impact how the rest of the church feels. Verse 26, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And so, for example, let me give you two examples here. Let's take a, a, a painful one and then a, a happy one. Let's say you wake up one morning, you got a queasy stomach, upset stomach. You know from experience that the stomach is not the only thing that's affected. When the stomach gets affected, what happens? The head hurts, the head gets affected. The overall energy of the body goes down. Arms don't want to raise up. Arms don't want to lift anything. Arms don't want to carry anything. Feet don't want to walk. Feet don't want to move. Feet don't want to run. All feet and legs want to do is sit down on the couch, relax, and conserve energy. Amen? Likewise, or similarly, but on the other hand, though, I should say, let's say you have a happy situation that befalls you. You fall in love or you receive a big job promotion that's got a big old pay raise attached to it. How does that affect the rest of the body? Well, the head gets happier, the heart gets lighter, the overall energy level of the body goes up, the arms want to lift up and say hallelujah, thank you Jesus, and the legs and the feet, well, you know what it is. You got a pep in your step and a glide in your stride because it's happy, and something that feels happy 
exhilarates and exalts the entire body. And so, it, so it, when one, in the church, when one of our members is grieving, we all feel that sadness and that sorrow with them. When one of our members is being persecuted, we all feel the righteous anger involved in that, as well as the pain of their horrible situation of suffering for the cause of Christ. When one member is blessed or exalted or honored, we walk around with our heads up and our chests out and our arms uplifted and our hearts rejoicing because of God's good work in their lives. And so certainly, how much more, how much more today do we sorrow for the church when the entire global church is being increasingly hated and rejected and persecuted even in our own country? Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how's the salt going to be re-seasoned? And the answer is, it's not. Jesus goes on to say, that salt is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And that's exactly what we see happening a lot today in the church or to the church. And then finally, this leads to my last point. In the human body, one body part can sometimes hurt, irritate, or annoy the rest of the body. In the church, same thing can happen. How many of you had a, had a bad, ever had a bad hair day? Everybody's had a bad hair day. What's a bad hair day? A bad hair day is the, our own body acting what? Against our own wishes. That's the body acting against us, all right? And sometimes that can cause a lot of frustration, that can cause a lot of irritation, and in some people that can cause a lot of anxiety in folks, okay? Well, so it is in the church. We're all imperfect saints striving to live up to the high calling of taking Christ to a lost world, striving to live up to this holy calling of being perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. And so William McDonald adds this. We then make allowance for the faults and failures of others or for differing personalities, abilities, and temperaments. And it is not a question of maintaining a facade of courtesy while inwardly seething with resentment. It means positive love to those who irritate, disturb, or embarrass. And so as I close, I remind you that the Lord Jesus Christ left his body, the church, on earth to, to continue to carry out the ministry that he himself began. And it takes all church members working, period, but then working together for the good of the church in order to satisfy that, that high calling, again, of taking Christ to a lost world. And so I leave you with this question this morning. Are you using your gifts? God bless you this morning, Fern Creek. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing our last song. Others, let us come together, walking in the Spirit. There's much to be done. We will come reaching out from our comfort. And they will know us by our love Sisters, we were made for kindness We can pierce the darkness As he shines through us He will come reaching 
with a song of healing. And they will know us by our love. The time is now. Come church, arise. Love with his hands. See with his eyes. Bind it around you. Let it never Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have come to the end of worship, and we want to thank you that we were able to be here today. We thank you for the gifts and talents that you have given us, and we pray that you would fan them into flame so that we can serve you and glorify you in all that we do. Bless us as we leave this place. Open our eyes to those in need and those who are lost, and help us to be a blessing to everyone that we meet and interact with. Help us never to forget that you're always with us. In Jesus' name, we believe and pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.